Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one laura monaco torelli Laura is the founder of Animal Behavior Training Concepts in Chicago, Illinois. She began her career in 1991 at Chicago's Shed Aquarium, where she trained beluga whales, dolphins, sea otters, seals, river otters, and penguins. She has also worked at the San Diego Zoo and then Brookfield Zoo as a lead supervisory trainer. During her time in the zoo community, Laura worked with a wide variety of terrestrial animals, including primates, large cats, birds of prey, horses, parrots, tree kangaroos, giraffes, red pandas, and dogs. Laura now serves as a faculty member of the Karen Pryor Academy and as a teaching assistant for Dr. Susan Friedman's Living and Learning with Animals online course. She and her team at Animal Behavior Training Concepts offer private in-home training as well as group classes at Medical District Veterinary Clinic, an extension of the University of Illinois College of Veterinary medicine. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Laura to the show today. Laura, how are you? Oh, I'm well, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with this generous invitation, Ryan, and it's been enjoyable to learn more about your Animal Training Academy. I keep hearing amazing feedback from many friends and colleagues, so this is extremely reinforcing for me to be here. Thank you. It's a huge win-win because it's an absolute honor to have you here with us today, Laura. Thank you for taking the time to to come hang out with us and we've had a great uh, nearly hour-long chat before the show as well (laughs) and I bet there's people it wasn't recorded so you know that was was, was just a private conversation between you and I which is a lot of fun and I bet there's a bunch of people in the podcast audience right now Laura going what the heck is a tree kangaroo They are a beautiful species of animal. Um, I would suggest, you know, work on some continuing education. Google tree kangaroo. They're absolutely beautiful, very smart. Um, I think one of my favorite memories when I worked with them was when a female's little Joey was in the pouch and we'd go in in our morning rounds to check on all the animals and the little Joey would peek out and the mom would be like, we're here. And the little Joey would go back in the pouch. And I actually have, I actually have a picture of the Joey in the mom's pouch peeking out. So I'll send it to you privately. It's pretty, it's pretty cute. Beautiful. And I was really <laughs> fortunate to see one crossing the road in the Daintree Rainforest in Cairns oh. when I lived there. It's one of my favorite wildlife experiences. I just wasn't expecting to see that. Was it was it a quick view or did, was it a little bit prolonged? Did you it, get... It, it paused, stopped, yeah. looked, and then kept going. Yeah. And I was looking for, I was looking for cassowaries. So <laughs> I just wasn't um, expecting to see that. Don't cassowaries have the ability to disembowel? <laughs> Like, yes. don't they have a, yeah, I've, I've never worked with cassowaries. Am I recalling this right? They're very dangerous with a specific um, nail that's at the back of their foot, right? Yeah, close I, contact training is something that we practice here in yes. Australasia. Yes, I've never had the pleasure of working with one, but um, 
uh, pretty neat that you were looking for one in the wild. <laughs> yeah, we, we've, we saw quite a few. Uh, if you live in the north, north of Queensland, state of Australia, then uh, there is some beautiful pockets of rainforest uh, and, oh. and species up there. So send me a picture of, of a cassowary. I I'll will. send you a tree kangaroo. I will. And I wish I got a photo of that tree kangaroo. It just wasn't <laughs> quick enough. So cool. We're going to get started, Laura, and dive into the first question. Could you please take everyone listening back to where you first started, where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training, and tell us some stories about some of the first animals you ever trained using it? Absolutely. Um, My formal career in animal training started at Shedd Aquarium, um, as you shared, in 1991. But the story behind that story was my first exposure of working with um, um, field biologists and uh, scientists with the study of wild bottlenose dolphins um, in the Sarasota Bradenton waters. And that was through the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, um, which is headed by the principal um, investigator, the principal scientist, Dr. Randy Wells. And so as, as I'm sure you know, and, um, and hello to all of your, your animal training um, academy members as well that are also active in the zoo and aquarium community, is that everybody knows everybody. And when I had my first exposure working around exotic animals, it was actually working with um, volunteering with this, this program in June of 1991. So I was a young pup. And uh, Dr. Randy Wells and his research team um, would bring in volunteers and we would help with two weeks uh, on the water, helping scientists and graduate students and postdoc and PhD candidates all working on their various research projects. Uh, And it was my first amazing in-depth experience about what a collaboration looks like with passionate people that are like-minded. They're wickedly brilliant. They know their science and they're excited to share it. One of the marine mammal veterinarians that was on this project um, was Dr. Dave Casper. And he happened to be one of the marine mammal veterinarians at Shedd Aquarium at the time. So when I was down there volunteering, just bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, just so excited to, you know, sc- like, you know, scrub the bottom of a boat. Like, I was happy to do anything they were going to ask me to do, right? You know, fill more coolers with ice, you know. Uh, Dr. Casper told me about uh, a new oceanarium that was opening in Chicago with Shedd Aquarium. And I had mentioned to him that upon my return from the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, uh, I had an interview with the volunteer department at Shedd Aquarium. And so uh, uh, Dr. Randy Wells, is he's employed through Brookfield Zoo, but he's based down at Moat Marine Lab, which is kind of where their hub is at, where they launch out into the bay for their research. So it's kind of a connect the dots much like so many of us in this community where you met someone, you had something in common, you started to talk about your interests and, and the conversation and the connections go from there. And then uh, I never looked back and continued to volunteer for Dr. Wells's program um, every summer for the, for the field research. Uh, but if your listeners get a chance, you know, visit sarasotadolphin.org. Um, they're doing amazing field research uh, on so many different topics um, and a great team of, of scientists that want to share the science. And it was just a series of connect the dots. And then Ken Ramirez hired me a couple months later and I worked there for almost 10 years as a marine mammal trainer. Very lucky. And, 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 and every day I know I'm lucky that Ken and uh, Lisa Takaki were my first animal training mentors as well, as was Dr. Wells, but his was field research. So your career, if you're listening and you're wanting to get into animal training, could start with scrubbing the bottom of a boat. <laughs> you, you never know. If, if you scrub it with a smile on your face with a lot of enthusiasm, someone's watching your work ethic, always watching that work ethic. So there's no room for complaining. You just got to scrub that boat. <laughs> Sound like you're hungry. You're hungry for getting your foot in the door. Oh, absolutely. And such great memories. Such great memories. And I think you called yourself a young pup. I was a young pup. I was yeah. eight at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I was twenty one. I was, I was, and I, yeah, I was a young pup, and then uh, I got hired at Shed Aquarium when I was twenty two. So very lucky, very lucky to have started my career under such brilliant um, mentors that were so happy to be helpful. 
And you know, they were just happy to happy to show you the way, but knowing like, but you know, you got to work hard. You have to really do the work and always be the learner. Always, you know, um, you know, you you were sharing with me about this amazing conference that you were just you know, helped to spearhead and you were with amazing people for days and you were there also learning. I think that's, that's also uh, an important element of what we all need to have as a touchstone is that um, hopefully we never think we know it all. We're always learning from others and we're always um, updating our information and following what's new, what, what, what the recent research is showing us and seeing what our colleagues are putting out. Yeah, we have a saying at ATA and it's the more you learn, the less you know. Yeah, it's so true. That's so true. So you were eight and I was 21. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't even know what I was doing at eight years <laughs> And so you were interviewed by Ken Ramirez? Say that again. Where you interviewed, you went in to Shed Aquarium and you, you had an interview. Who interviewed you for that position? Was it Ken? It was, yeah, it was Ken Ramirez and uh, Jim Robinette. Um, Jim Robinette has since retired from Shed. And as we all know, Ken Ramirez left Shed Aquarium a couple years ago to head up Karen Pryor Clicker Training and Karen Pryor Academy Clicker Expo. So uh, when I came back from volunteering for the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, uh, I had an interview in the volunteer department. And at that time, it was the volunteer department that had interviewed me. Um, so I, um, I was offered three volunteer slots. One was Marine Mammals. That's where I met Ken and Lisa. The other was the education department. So I took a volunteer slot um, with the amazing ed- education team at SHED. And my mentor in that department was Cheryl Mel, who's still there. And then in lab and in, in, uh, in the veterinary services department. So one of my jobs is one of the volunteers was to do um, water collection samples in the oceanarium and uh, the fishes department. And then we would bring it back to lab and run water quality uh, analysis and all that neat chemistry. So it was a, you know, a young pup in three different departments, learning from a lot of great people. And then Worked my way into uh, an opportunity to interview for a full-time position in marine mammals and, you know, volunteered. You know, I was still in college and uh, when I wasn't in school, I was at Shed and whatever they asked me to do in marine mammals, I would scrub that floor with a smile on my face, you know, scrub that bucket, <laughs> you know, like it would shine. And uh, then, the, you know, Ken, Ken offered me that, that dream job and never looked back for the next almost 10 years. Yeah, wonderful. And we're going to move on soon and talk about making a memorable mentor. And you've mentioned the word mentor a couple of times already uh, in your response to this first part of the podcast. Just before we do move on, though, I'm a, I'm a big story geek. I like stories. So can you share with us maybe a couple of stories, one at least of your experience at Shed and one or some of the first animals you trained there? Oh, absolutely. Um, You know, there is a specific story that pops up, but I'm going to like cross promote here because I told it on my podcast with Hannah Brannigan recently. So why don't you guys hop over to Hannah's podcast and my talk about husbandry because I talked about one of my memorable memories of working with a veterinarian, Dr. Bohm, and I'll end it there. So hop over to Hannah and then hop back. Um, I think a memorable memory for me was one of the early conversations that I had with Ken as a new trainer. And when, when we're offered a position, you know, you don't get to work with the animals right away. So you're paired up with an experienced trainer and you do a shadowing process. And to complement that, he gave us a book to read called Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. And this, you know, back in 1991, um, as a side note, I, I have it in my bookcase. I can't grab it right now, but I'll send you a picture. I have that book signed multiple times from Karen up until like two years ago. So every time I see her, she signs it for me. And my earliest, I think, memorable memory from those early conversations with Ken was that in order to become a skilled trainer, we need a balance of the hands-on with the book smarts as well. And the ability to not only work with the learner in real time, whether it's an animal or an intern or a volunteer that's shadowing us, but then also to be able to do justice to talking the science 
as intended, that we know what we're talking about. And so that early memory was of him saying, okay, congratulations, you're part of our team. You're not going to touch a dolphin for a while until we clear you. Or um, all of us worked with the whales and dolphins, but then we were assigned to the sea otter, the seal, or the penguin team. And I was on the sea otter team. So at the time, we had five um, northern or Alaskan sea otters. And since you love stories, I'll tell you four of them were rescued from the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989. So um, I was working with um, and observing the beluga whale and Pacific white-sided dolphin training team and then the sea otter team. And then Ken would call us in his office and we would have quizzes about what we had to read in that chapter from Don't Shoot the Dog. So he would have us practicing early on when we're like doing something like this. You know, I'm talking with you, I'm talking with a colleague, that when we're sharing ideas or we're problem solving together, that we're as up to date with the science and the laws of learning as is possible. So I could go on and on with that, but that's an early memory with, with Ken was <laughs> Ryan's gesturing like, just keep on passion talking. Um, or as you say in the Animal Training Academy, we're going to make more ripples. Um, it's, it's that early memory of that impact that I had, you know, 1991, that's 27 years ago, with Ken's dedication to his team to make sure that we were always learning. And then we would observe a trainer work with an animal. And then there was a whole checkoff list. So back then, a lot of dry erase boards, which, you know, I love dry erase boards, um, a lot of checkoff lists. And then they would observe us with basic fluent behaviors. And then we would get through this clearing process. And then they'd say, okay, you are now cleared to do this, um, these specific behaviors with this sea otter. Um, okay, go. And then they would just think, okay, go. You're, you know, you're now cleared. But we always knew we could touch back if we had questions. So that's my early, I think, learning experience that I've carried with me through my career was the impact of that balance that can, to this day, shares. You know, there's so many important traits of being a skilled trainer. Well, way to exceed expectations with that story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm looking forward to the rest of the podcast. I, I already was, obviously, but now I am even more so. It's a great conversation. As you said, we could probably stay on this for a while. We won't, though, in the interest of time. What we will yeah. do is in the podcast write-up, we will include something brand new, and it will be called Hop Over to Hannah. <laughs> We'll have a link there where you can actually, because we've got a lot of the same guests, so you can hop over from the write-up on Animal Training Academy and listen uh, to more from this wonderful guest uh, on Hannah. We, we should just hashtag that, hop over to Hannah. Oh, hashtag hop over to Hannah, all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Done. And then Hannah can say hop over to Ryan, and then you guys can just continue this beyond me, and it'll be fun to watch on we the need, side. We need an alliteration that starts with R and isn't hop. Run over to Ryan. We'll work on that one. Riffle over to I Ryan. Like Ryan's riffles. <laughs> right. I like it. We'll shelf that for now um, and let us know anyone in the audience if you have any ideas about the alliteration we could use for Hannah hopping over to Ryan. But <laughs> before we move on to the next question, just bring everyone up to speed uh, and tell people where they can go to learn more about you now. We'll do this at the end of the podcast as well, uh, but let people know listening right now where they can go to, to find about, out more about what you're up to now uh, and, and get in contact with you. Sure. Um, you guys can always visit my website. Um, I have a different, a bunch of different domain names, but lauramonacoterelli.com will get you to my website, um, L-A-U-R-A-M-O-N-A-C-O. T-O-R-E-L-L-I dot com, as well as animal behavior training concepts dot com will also get you there. And I recently have um, a new project that I've been working on and uh, explore the joy of learning together dot com also gets you to the same website. All right. And we'll link to all of the stuff in the podcast right up. So wonderful, and I absolutely love hearing about people's behavioral odysseys. So, thank you very much for sharing, Laura. Oh, thank you for thank you for this conversation. I'm having a great time already. Wonderful, me too. And moving forward, what I'd really like to talk about now is what we labelled before, and, and I mentioned it just before. We labelled it as the make. Well, you labelled it, I should say, the making of a memorable mentor. Could you please yeah. talk to this for us and build upon what I think you have already talked about some of these topics? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when I 
over the years, when I have new trainers, and I don't want to say younger, because I have people my age that are like, I want to now do a complete career change and get into animal training. So new trainers um, approach me just asking, you know, how did I get started? Uh, And that's, I'm sure, a common question you hear when people say, you know, how do I get my foot in the door to work with exotic animals? How do I get my foot in the door to get a job at the zoo? Um, And I always think back to, and I always share with others, to never forget what it was like when we felt that way at the start of our career. And for us to always remember what it was like when we were trying so hard to get that first break, when we were volunteering tirelessly, when we were interviewing at zoos and aquariums or at, you know, dog daycare facilities or boarding or um, whatever your interest is, or if you want to get in the veterinary profession, you know, just trying to get that break so you can put that on your application to get into vet school. And for us to never forget the first people and the subsequent individuals that really took the time to help us with no strings attached. And it's those memorable mentors that, you know, that I've been saying this for years now, like who's your memorable mentor or mentors plural? Who is the person that you think back to that there's flashbacks that they replied to your back for me (laughs) back in the early nineties, you know, who replied to your phone call. Um, I actually have, it's on my desk. I know that this isn't a visual recording. It's only audio, but um, I'll show it to you since you and I have video, but this is my actual letter from Dr. Randy Wells who wrote me back and Ryan, it is dated the 4th of January, 1990. He wrote me back. So this young kid who read an article that he authored in a scientific journal, right? And I was young. I'm like, I'm going to write this guy a letter, right? He'll never write me back. He wrote me back. It's been framed now for 28 years on my desk. And I look at that and I think, he wrote me back and told me about his research program, said they were looking for volunteers. And so if your ATA um, Academy members are listening to our conversation, I'm sh- hopefully you guys are nodding your head going, oh my gosh, I remember I was so eager. I was just hungry for someone to just give me that break or for someone just to sit with me for 15 or 30 minutes and tell me about how they got to where they are today. So never forget what we felt like at the start of our career. And if your memorable mentor is someone that you're still in touch with, that you're, you know, you have good relationship with, email them, do old school handwritten thank you card. My gosh, call them and just say thank you because some of them might not expect it. They might not remember Um, But how neat would it be to double back and circle that loop of reinforcement and to say, thank you for helping me. And this is where I'm at today. And you made a difference in my career. And to me, that's part of a memorable mentor. Coupled with, um, I look at my mentors and to me, they're still my mentors, but I have so many that they challenge me. So when I make a training video, I send my video out privately to my core group of of mentors or colleagues, and I will show them the video unedited. I'll give them the rundown of of what the video is. And they don't dance around it. It's not all, oh, it's so great. It's perfect. Don't change a thing. A skilled mentor pushes us to think a little bit deeper, to look at um, how we're setting up the environment for our learner to be successful, to assess the reinforcers, to look at the consequences. And, you know, so if I send a video out to, um, you know, I think of um, Susan Friedman or Ken or Kathy Sadeo, um, I'm so grateful that they come back with more questions so we continue the dialogue because then it makes me a better trainer for people and animals. And that's what mentors do, in my opinion. What do you think? What do you think makes a memorable mentor? Who are some of yours? Well, do you want me to keep talking? <laughs> uh, I want you to keep talking. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, shout out to, to Nick Bishop, if you're listening, who uh, the ATA members met in previous web classes uh, and, who, and who was that person that, I, you know, I remember what it was like when I first started. And when someone listens to you, it's like you hear the angels singing. Yes, right. Uh, and, and big shout out to Dr. Susan Friedman, uh, who to this day marvels me with how quickly she responds to people's emails. Uh, and right? she's, she's taught me a lot about that. You know, 
it is it is such a valuable skill to be able to provide reinforcement when someone reaches out to us and to have that ability to create a safe learning atmosphere where someone, you know, a client even, or a colleague, even a family member that reaches out with, with a genuine question and not make them feel stupid, not make them feel um, ashamed, not making them feel less than. Our goal is to help them feel more than. And, you know, uh, you and I were talking a couple weeks ago, and I think about the saying, um, an attitude of gratitude. And even when our mentors push us, and sometimes our learning gets really uncomfortable, like um, when I went through my Tag Teach certifications with Teresa McKeon, she observed me working as a consultant in the zoo community. Um, She observed me working with dog owners. She observed Karen Pryor Academy workshops and observed me as a teacher for my KPA students. And what I also liked about Teresa is um, her ability to highlight what you do well with also framing it about how you can do it better and not causing you to be, you know, a delicate flower who just shuts down. I think it's important that we're resilient, that we learn to take feedback and go, you know, thank you for that. Thank you for taking the time to fly into Chicago to watch me teach, or thank you for taking the time, like, you know, like I think of Susan Friedman or Ken or Kathy, um, uh, so many of of my mentors um, who will watch my videos. And I'm like, you know, thank you, because you didn't even have to do that and provide feedback and say, okay, you know, I observed this, this, and this. Um, If you didn't see that, I suggest that you watch the video again and let's talk it out. Maybe I can better understand your criteria. And, uh, And that's a gift. That's a gift of a gifted teacher and a gifted mentor to give us that safe place of learning without shutting someone down. And isn't that the same with an animal, right? A dog, a a bird of prey, a primate, that we're giving them the ability to feel safe in their environment to make mistakes. Well, what we call mistakes, it might not be a mistake, but something that we would view as, oh, I want less of that um, without the fallout of aversives or punishment. Um, and this is just part of that bigger scope of a memorable mentor. And, uh, and I'm so grateful, you know, and it's like, I have so many in my head that I want to say out loud, but then I don't want it to be, oh, Laura's name dropping on Ryan's podcast. So I have many, I've just said a few, but there are so many. Ryan's gesturing that he wants more, but I have so many. And, um, you know, I'm also grateful that, um, that my husband, he, he still works at Shed Aquarium. He's not an animal trainer. He's in a completely different department. But there are times where I'll just be like off on this training, blah, blah, blah. I've got all this stuff coming up. Or he walks in the room and I'm videotaping and he walks in the middle of the video and he's like, hey, what's going on? You know, and, 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 and we're able to laugh. I'm like, hey, thanks for being a distraction. Like, you know, looking at a really safe learning environment is important. And that just, that bridges back to our memorable mentors for all of us, for me, you, for your Animal Training Academy um, teams. And then who pushes you to be better? And who does it in a way where you're like, oh yeah, that was, I see what you're doing now. And, and it's not all, you know, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. It's like, well, so what, what's your next approximation? What's your plan? You know, and like Ken and Susan, you know, what's plan A? And then you've got plan B. And if that doesn't go well, you've already got plan C lined up, right? Because if plan C falls out, what's your plan D? And uh, I'm always learning. I'm learning how to do that better with people too. And now I'm passion talking. So. No, it's good. And, and I'm, I've got a lot of different tangents we could go off on here, but I'm not going to. Once again, <laughs> in the interest of time, I say that more and more these days in this podcast. What I can tell people, or maybe not, you're going to have to tell me if I can say this or not. Moving forward, we have a blog post on this topic that's going to beef out some of these ideas a little bit more. I do. I do. So um, I have a wonderful 12-day window um, from this recording to you making it go live. But one of my mentors, um, whose name is going to be in the blog post, whose name I haven't said yet. So there's my teaser. Um, but by the time this goes live, the blog post will be live. I had a lovely conversation with this mentor a couple months ago. And she looked across the table at me and said, why are you not writing about the making of a memorable mentor? Like it is, 
it is so much of where we've all been in our career. So then I'm going to launch the blog post contingent on your podcast going live. And then I can direct people to your ATA podcast and, you know, thinking about the making of a memorable mentor who, who ours are and how each of us set the stage to hopefully be a memorable mentor for those that come to us saying, I just need a break. I need that, that, um, that website or, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, sending people to, to different um, websites, like let's say if they go to AZA and they want to look at the job postings or they want to go to um, uh, ABMA or, or IMATA or looking at different dog training organizations. We have such a powerful community of talented colleagues out there doing amazing things under different skill sets, whether it's competition obedience, um, working with service dogs, working with exotic animals. We're not short on mentors out there, and, there, and there's people out there doing great things. You know, they've got great online mentorship programs. So just bridging back to your little teaser is, yes, I, I, am, I am finessing the last editing parts of this blog post. And I got that gentle nudge from a mentor going, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing it? Okay, do it. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> cool. Well, we're going we're gonna to tie some of these ideas together in the next question, actually. Uh, so how about right under hop over to Hannah, we have leap over to Laura. <laughs> and we have... <laughs> I love it. We have a link to you. Hashtag leap to Laura. Leap over or leap? Leap over. I like leap over. I don't know. You know what? You come up with it and then I'm going to use it. We'll let let the ATA community come up with it. See what what they hashtag. I like that. If anyone's out there and they feel unlistened to, right under, hop over to Laura in the podcast write up. So you have to go to the ATA page into the actual write up for this episode. I'll put a link and we'll have a free 20 minute video call consult that you can book in if you want to. And I will take time to connect with you personally and we'll make a plan A, B, C, and D for you. Nice job. And there you are being a memorable mentor. You're yes. already doing it. You're already doing it with, we know, with the ATA. I am blessed of the ATA. You're making ripples, right? <laughs> making making ripples and sometimes waves and sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> sometimes a tsunami. <laughs> Just happens. When you combine all of the ripples together, hopefully. And that was, that was a lot of fun to learn about. For our next question, as mentioned, I wanted to build upon something we talked about there. And that is training across different species and industries. You're obviously a great person to discuss this with, considering your experience. Laura, could you please share with us your offerings about what zookeepers and dog trainers can learn from each other? Oh, absolutely. Man, if we only had like five hours to just keep talking. Um, From my own personal experience, I will share a bit of the... I guess, um, adjustment period that I had when I crossed over to the dog training community. So a lot of people will ask me, like, how did I get from exotics to dogs? And when I worked at Brookfield Zoo, the department that I was in, we had dogs. And so that was just the transition. So um, we had four dogs, two border collies and two, what I call mix of good things. They were a mix of breeds, mix of good things. And we would bring the dogs out. Uh, the border collies, um, would, their names were Pete and Peggy. Uh, they would come out for sheep herding demos because we had sheep and we had border collies. Um, and then the mixed breeds, we would bring out and walk around zoo grounds and talk about grooming and positive training and connecting with the zoo guests that do you have a dog at home? And then before I knew it, and like meanwhile, when I was still in the zoo community full time, um, I was an active member of a lot of the organizations that you and I have already talked about. So I was part of um, ABMA and AZA and IMATA um, and these wonderful community of zoo and aquarium trainers that would meet at conferences and we would publish articles, we would share videos we would have regional meetings. There were, you know, there was always a conversation going. And my earliest memories from the early '90s of um, of a great level of camaraderie. So then, in 2003, 2004 was when I started to do more dog training, and I kind of felt at that time that I was uh, kind of on an island. So I was still part of the zoo and aquarium organizations and communities. 
And I knew that I was going to be applying the same laws of learning, the same science to working with dogs and now with people, um, the average dog owner who's looking for help. But I, I kind of felt um, that there was this, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to find the right word. There was just this vacuum. Like I, I, I felt a little bit alone. And so I started looking into different dog training organizations. At the time, I was looking at um, APDT, um, CCPDT um, at the time, and then Karen Pryor Academy launched shortly uh, a couple years after that. So tying back to your earlier question is I think that there's an important need for community and collaboration of what we can learn, no matter the species, as long as we're continuing the dialogue of how we're applying the science, no matter the species. So just because, you know, Ryan works with birds of prey doesn't mean that he couldn't have a helpful perspective on this dog training problem if I were to pose some questions, you know, kind of having a hard time problem solving this. If you put your eyes on this baseline video, are you seeing something that I'm not seeing? And looking at how, you know, Dr. Friedman talks about the benefit of running a functional analysis right away. Um, um, I'm sorry, a functional assessment, a functional assessment right away. And when we're looking from a problem solving model, especially when I work with, with dog owners, I say, it, you know, it doesn't have to be so hard. I know you're exhausted. I, I am empathetic to your frustration. And I think a level of, of um, empathy from zoo and aquarium trainers is, there are many times that us as exotic animal trainers have just been stumped. We're like, you know, I am getting nowhere with these approximations and we just have to stop the sessions and sit back and look at a functional assessment and assess the problem behavior, what, what's occurring in the antecedent, what's the cue, what's the stimulus, and what's the consequence that's maintaining or reinforcing it. And when I come over and then swing over to the dog side of it is it's common for us in the zoo and aquarium field to look at um, the social politics. You know, so is it breeding season? You know, are the large cats not coming over because pheromones are strong? And all they can think about right now is pheromones and maybe breeding. That's why they're not coming to station, perhaps. And we're checking off our problem-solving model. Then we swing over to the dog problem-solving model. And let's say we have a um, a nine, 10 month old uh, intact female dog who might be, at, you know, in her first estrus cycle. And the owners are wondering, you know, are, are wondering why there's a increase in vocalizations. Um, the female dog is more body tactile sensitive. Um, maybe like for me, um, my current Ridgeback Santino, he's still intact. So if I bring them to workshops, I ask ahead of time, is anyone bringing an intact female and is she in heat? Because if she is, I might rethink my plan here because that's going to affect behavior. And so this carryover is, you know, we're not operating in, in, in separate isolated worlds. We have so many similarities where coming from an zoo and aquarium background, you know, as you know, we go through our checklist, you know, are there medical concerns? Is the animal not coming to station or not, you know, like, a, like I think about um, when I worked with uh, lemurs, you know, uh, are they not offering their hand to a target because maybe they sprained a finger, you know, uh, um, swinging from branch to branch. So we rule out the medical. It's the same with dogs. We rule out um, social politics or breeding politics, um, canine politics. You know, do we have a young puppy? And now is the puppy all paws blazing, adolescent, and now they're just all teenager, which can be a challenging time for dog owners because they're wondering where the cute puppy went and now they have a full-blown adolescent dog. So there's so many similarities where my friends that are like you were, were kind of in both worlds a little bit. We, we see it. It's like, it's, it's right there like a flashing, you know, um, sign on the street that, that there are so similar, there, there are a lot of similarities in our conversation from exotic to domestic training. The model's the same. The laws of learning are the same. Um, and earlier, what I found was finding a community of trainers in, in the dog training community with organizations that I joined, where then I felt that camaraderie that I get from the different zoo and aquarium um, organizations that have annual meetings or regional meetings. 
and, you know, showing videos of polar bear training and saying, yeah, I'm kind of stumped here. And then someone will bring up something about water quality, you know, like, have you changed the temperature contingent on seasonal changes? And it's like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. And don't we have those same aha moments when it comes to the dog community too? I think so. And the more brains looking at your problem, you don't, I mean, you don't know what's neurons are going to fire in someone's brain when they look at your situation, yeah. Yeah. which might not even be the solution, but it might offer some piece of information that makes someone else's neurons fire, which then leads to brainstorming. To brainstorming the, is a skill. I think that say that, say that again. I'm sorry. I said brain, brainstorming is a skill. I think that is, is actually in my personal opinion, and let me know what you think here, right? As important for us as trainers to learn as timing shaping, it's the ability to problem solve. Absolutely. And uh, one of the most recent videos that I put out, um, my first, well, it's kind of my second video, but my first video showcasing training is about the elegance of capturing behavior. And that's so much of what I learned in exotic animal training was to see what the learner offers as us offers us naturally and be there to reinforce it. So we increase that frequency of the behavior. And I had a lovely conversation um, with a new client last night. Um, I put the cute picture of, of their dog on my social media pages, whose name is Zoe, just this little button of a, of a breed dog. And uh, what I had said to them was, you know, my, my goal for you right now is to bring back Back the joy that you have in being a dog owner. And you don't have to overmanage her all the time. You don't have to be keep giving her verbal cues or visual cues over and over and over. Because here's the good news. She knows how to offer what you're looking for. You just need to give her a safe environment to offer that behavior naturally. And then right there on the spot, I went into capturing as I'm talking to the owners. And we started to talk about canine communication. And I had shared with them, you know, have you ever been at a family get together? And you know that that cousin, let's say, is going to be there that you can really only take 10 minutes of a year. And you've had your 10 minutes, but now you need to go to the other room where maybe another family members are, you know, are at that you're just for some reason, more comfortable to be around. So when your dog creates space, they're doing it as a way to diffuse the situation from escalating. But if your cousin follows you to the other room and they get in your face, that's where family fights break out, you know? And so I got a beautiful, um, I got a reinforcing follow-up email from them this morning saying that they noticed when they were taking little Zoe on a walk that she saw two other dogs, stopped walking, and then turn, turned on her own to walk in the other direction. And they normally would have been like, oh, let's say hi. And that's why they're having dog-to-dog problems on walks. And they just said, Zoe showed us she didn't want to be closer to the dogs. And we listened to her and we walked in the other direction. And it went great. And I thought, listen, you know, look at you listening to that conversation, which ties back to your earlier point of brainstorming is a skill. Listening is a skill, like really listening to not just um, the humans, but listening to what the animal is offering and then advocating for their animal to say, you know, your dog isn't being bad. Your dog isn't being dominant. Your dog isn't trying to rule the world. Your dog is just stressed under these conditions and then let them see it through their eyes. I kind of feel like I went off on a side tangent. Was, was that relevant? Super relevant. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you say is relevant. We are going to have to push on though because of time. I know okay. there's loads of people who listen to the show for all of that stuff that you just said is going to be highly beneficial. So thank you very much for sharing. Oh, thank you. For this next part of the podcast, I want to discuss something we haven't actually really spoke directly to before and that is loose. This is a tongue tie for me. <laughs> loose leash walking. <laughs> loose leash walking now this is a huge topic so we're just gonna go with the flow and see where it takes us but maybe get us started with the first things that come to your mind when we start to think about loose leash walking yes um and i'm I'm gonna say lw from now on so i'm just gonna shorten (laughs) lw Um, 
Because it is, it is a tongue twister. Um, you're right. This is such a meaty topic. And there are so many skilled trainers out there that have already put great information out that I'm sure you could guide your ATA members to. And I think it was a year or two ago, and I, I, I can't remember the name of the trainer. And if you can, please help me credit it. But it was called the Rucksack Walk, the, the, the Rucksack Walk. But I can't remember. It was a fella overseas. Um, I see an animal. I see a little critter behind you. Um, And so for your listeners, Google the rucksack walk. It was a fella. I can't remember his name. Kay Lawrence talked about him presenting at a conference. And I don't know if it was at a Woof conference with Chirag Patel, the Woof conference, or a different one. But folks, Google Rucksack Walk, and it was it, it's lovely. But this is, LLW is a meaty topic. But I think what I want to springboard from is that uh, the walk begins before we walk out the door. Long before we, we open any exit door and us and our dogs are heading out into the great big world. Um, for me, it's downtown Chicago. So I'm, I'm very urban, um, which is a challenge for some of our client base and their dogs because they're not given much room to navigate personal space. So when we're looking at someone saying, I'm having problems with loose leash walking, my dog, or my dog has problems walking on leash, always loop back to the functional assessment, explain um, to them why you're going to start with the problem behavior, identify the antecedent or the cue or the stimulus, and then the immediate reinforcer. But then I think an important part is advocating for the process because with LLW, that's a pretty broad criteria. <laughs> and my, my criteria for LLW with, with my Ridgeback, who's a hunting dog who loves to smell and loves to watch wildlife, might be different than someone who has a husky and might be different than someone who has a chihuahua. But if we have a young puppy who stops walking and it's because the puppy is assessing auditory input, visual input, um, olfactory input, the, the average puppy owner isn't factoring those important variables in. So I think our skill set as skilled trainers is to say, okay, you know, we, we have a young puppy and this young puppy is probably doesn't have endurance yet to take the long walks that you want to take. So show me what the walk looks like that you're concerned about. And I have them show me baseline from the minute they pick up the equipment in the house to us getting back in after the walk. And I then review the video with them in separate segments. So I'll say, okay, let's take a look at what's happening inside. When you bring out your dog's harness or collar, I see your dog running away from you rather than running to you and saying, yes, put my clothes on, please. The dog is running away, showing that they want distance from the equipment. So we talk about that. (coughs) We will. We might have to keep in mind that if it's a younger dog, an adolescent, that hasn't had, uh, at least stateside here, um, Halloween is a big holiday, so to speak. So you have this, you know, perhaps not a puppy, but a young adolescent dog who's seeing scary, billowy balloon things on front lawns that look scary or hanging from trees. And they're wondering why their adolescent dog is now lunging and barking at random objects. And then it's our job to help them identify what's happening in the environment. Um, but the walks, the walking goals should really start in the home. And that was another fun exercise that we worked on with little Zoe, who I talked about early last night, was I got baseline video of what it looks like when they bring out her harness and leash. And I said, okay, let's work on creating positive associations and let's let her put her clothes on. Let's let her step into her equipment versus you running after her, <laughs> so, you know, because she's avoiding for a reason. Now, I also want to preface, they're lovely dog owners. They adore her. She's living a beautiful life of adoration and treats and, 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 and a warm bed to sleep and, and a beautiful home. Um, but if a dog's arousal level is already escalated before we walk out the door, probability is high that it's only going to maintain or escalate when they walk out the door as well. What are your thoughts? Well, I think a number of things. Firstly, I love that we're talking about functional assessments when we're talking about 
loose leash walking. I'm going to say it because it's fun. Uh, <laughs> and I love that we're talking about starting this process and you, you, you labeled it as advocating for the process, but we're starting this process in the home. Now, I think one thing that might be beneficial for people listening to this show, uh, and I know that uh, something I'm working on at the moment with my Chihua Hua, and I know some other ATA members are working on this as well. Uh, and that is when we're not quite there yet, hundred percent with the at the home process, but we need to take our dog out to places and we need it to be safe. What advice can you give for people that are in, in that zone uh, and, and moving forward with the process? Does that make sense? Does my question make sense? Repeat the front end in, in what zone? What are the, what, what's the current problem behavior? Dog not moving towards harness or slash walking equipment, oh. clothing uh, to the point yeah. that it would be, labeled as the dog is voluntarily participating uh, but we need that we need that equipment on and so the process we've already got an aroused state when we're leaving the house what what yeah. input might you have and how might you be off, able to offer the listeners of this you podcast? Know, oh gosh excellent question and i think that does bridge back to it being a process and that i think what's what's um What's an empathetic perspective for us as a trainer is to highlight to the family that the behavior that your dog is demonstrating has a reinforcement history and it's become effective for them. So they've had time to rehearse it for quite a while. And I joke, but I'm also serious when I say to my client, as much as I would love to leave tonight and it be the ending of a happy Disney movie and everything's fixed, it's just like everything's fixed. Your dog is perfect with everything that you want. Behavior doesn't work that way. And what I enjoy putting out there as a suggestion is to try to set up an objective rating system that removes a bit of their emotion that's kind of already deeply woven into their frustration with their dog. So I'll say, you know, just keep a notebook by your kitchen table or wherever, by the door. And I want you to rate this behavior, whether it's trying to put equipment on. Um, Let's just start with that. So zero being um, no progress at all to three being this was amazing. It was the ending of a happy Disney movie. I want you to rate every attempt zero through three that you put your um, that you're attempting to put equipment on your dog. And I want you to keep these factors in mind is is there a reduction in latency? So is your dog approaching you more quickly? Um, Is there a reduction in speed? So are you able to put the equipment on as a behavior as a whole more quickly and look at your zero to three ratings and let's do this for you know two weeks let's just say two weeks and I think that helps to remove some of that emotional frustration if they could just look at a rating system and say okay you know um your chihuahua came over more quickly and you were able to get the equipment on within you know um let's say one minute on this session and then the next session it was 45 seconds and the next session it was two minutes but maybe it was two minutes because you know um, the dog heard a dog bark in the condo hallway who knows you know there was a stimulus that caused the dog to become stressed then the next attempt you were able to put the equipment on with low latency and speed within 30 seconds and just data just just give me the data boom 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 and that would be my suggestion is a launching point because you are shaping being less intensity of a stress response contingent on the presence of equipment. So it's not going to be black and white. What I'd also suggest to wrap that up is if you or your ATA members haven't done so already or advocate for our clients is to videotape you trying to do this with your dog and watch just you in the video upon review and then watch just the dog in the video upon review and assess what you can change on your end as the handler to increase the probability of a new desired behavior or what you can change in the environment. Because if we can set the stage for the problem behavior to be, you know, what what Dr. Friedman calls the three R's, you know, we've got if it's um, irrelevant, um, um, incompatible and inefficient, that's our goal is to make that problem behavior irrelevant, inefficient, and incompatible. So videotape yourself, review you, review you, um, review your dog, and let's do some data collection. It's a process. And it's a beautiful practical answer. Thank you for that. Oh, thanks to my mentors. <laughs> Sadly, we are nearly at the end now, Laura, but that's okay. 
because we're also heading into one of my favorite parts of the podcast show. And this is story time. <laughs> Laura, can you please share with everyone listening? You might hear my chihuahua in the background talking to me, telling me to hurry up with the game that we're simultaneously playing whilst we're recording this podcast. Uh, Laura, can you please share with everyone listening two or three stories from your experience training animals so far and some of the important lessons these have taught you along the way? Yes. Um, being pooped on the head by a penguin um, is... is um, sticky and funny at the same time um that's happened a few times (laughs) really good conditioner for the hair is you know having guano penguin poop highly recommended if you ever get the opportunity um (laughs) i'm just trying to think of some funny stories um I'm just trying to think now, should the name of this podcast be the making of a memorable mentor or being pooped on the head by a penguin is sticky? Yes. Um, as sticky and fun all at the same time. Um, I will share that other fun memories are teaching sea otters to give us what's in their pockets. So, um, sea otters as a, um, foraging strategy and the way that they're built, um, they have extra flaps of skin, like, a like in what would be our armpit area. And it's thought that sea otters have a larger left pocket. I'm like gesturing in our video to each other, but your viewers can only hear it. Um, and I remember in the years that I worked with the sea otters, when I would see my sister, um, she would say to me, did you reach in the sea otter pocket today? Cause she thought it was the cutest thing ever. And I'd say, yes, you know, or they would reach in their pocket and hand us whatever was in there. Um, that was a lot of fun as a behavior to teach, like what's in your pocket. And then they go like this with their sea otter paws while they're swimming. And then they hand it to you and then you give them, uh, you, you, you bridge and reinforce. Um, and I think I'll wrap up with the third, just being that I think animals are some of the best teachers we'll ever have. So back in the day when I started, we didn't have, you know, the technology we have today. We didn't have social media. We didn't have cell phones. You know, we would drive from A to B with a cassette player in the car. Um, journal your experiences, write them down, um, Take pictures. I have Tupperware bins of pictures of me working with various species and pictures of me looking back at friends and colleagues that I'm still friends with. Like like you and I were talking about Kirsten Anderson Hansen. She and I were marine mammal trainers at Shed. And it's such a small world, you know, that when you get home, when you're done working, I know it's long days. We have long days. But write something down in your journal about what you learned from that animal, whether it was training, whether it was um, habitat repair, whether, whether you were building a new habitat, whether it was enrichment, um, if an animal is pregnant and you are closely, closely monitoring their gestation period, if you had the joy of observing an animal being born, write it down because I guarantee you guys, it's going to be 28 years from now. And you're going to go, where did the years go? Where, like, slow it down. But if you have a journal or pictures to look back at, it's like you're back at yesterday. And and Ryan can't see it, but my desk is just covered in pictures of sea otters and blue whales and, and dolphins and tigers and, and um, artwork from my friends who are beautiful artists and thank you cards from my KPA students. Like, I have everything around me at my desk because... I look at it every day and I'm like, I remember that session with the beluga whale. I remember when that picture was taken. So, you know, animals are the best teachers that we'll ever have, but write down what they taught you so you don't forget it. How's that? I'm feeling like your desk is an attitude of gratitude desk. Oh, it is. That was a great wrap up. It is. It is an attitude of gratitude. Definitely agree with it. I have this. I have this on my desk. I don't know if you Expl- can see explain it. Explain to it for the listeners what it is. It's um, it's a coaster that reads. I'm showing it to Ryan right now. That reads, um, find something you love and roll in it. And another coaster. <laughs> have a picture of a dog. Up. Another coaster that reads, never give up. And then, of course, I have this by Susan Friedman. Her unlabel me stickers on my desk. Oh, beautiful. And her antecedent behavior consequence stickers. We can spend an hour. I could just be talking through everything that's on my desk that are just beautiful (laughs) memories of something that made me buy it and then my name tags with me and santino when we teach a workshop together oh very cool it's more exciting than my desk i must admit (laughs) well you have a cute chihuahua with you (laughs) she did get on the desk yesterday to be honest with you (laughs) 
Uh, well, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm having the time of my life, and I could just keep going for hours, but I know you've got to wrap it up. We've got one more question before we do. Just want to put a shout out to all of our animal teachers out there, to the, uh, the Pete's and Piggies of the world teaching us and, and the Zoes of the world being our great teachers as well. Just before we do move on to the final question, you said something there which is something that's been thrown around in the in the ATA members area at the moment uh, and, and specifically in a blog post put out by Rebecca Daker and that is this idea of slowing it down. Slow it down. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? What, what did you mean when you said this? Um, when we were talking earlier about loose leash walking or... No, you, you just said it then in your answer to this question uh, when you were talking about taking pictures and writing journal yeah. stuff down. Yes. Um, I think it's lovely that your ATA members are, are in the midst of this discussion and um, I need to read what, what this lovely um, trainer put out as far as a blog post. I'll, I'll tag you on it. Um, I can't compliment it enough that, and then again, I'm, I'm saying this like I'm 80, but coming from a generation where we didn't have all of this immediacy of technology in front of us, all these distractions, um, is to get back in the moment with our animal, with human or animal learner, with the client. Are you really listening to them or are you just listening to talk? Uh, same with the animal. And stopping for a moment and slowing it down in that for those of us that have our own furry animal uh, family members, the years fly by. We don't have them nearly as long as we want. So when we're busy bebopping around, um, I know something that I'm working hard on is when I'm done for the day, I power down all my technology so I am present and in the moment with my hands on my ridgeback, massaging him, petting him. I'm playing with my cats. And I'm not playing with them to videotape anything for anyone else to see. I'm just in the moment with my cats, with my dog. Um, I'm in the moment with my husband in the garden listening to the birds. Not everything has to be shared, you know, on social media with everything I'm doing. Because in my opinion, I mean, who really cares, you know, about me sitting in my garden listening to birds personally? Um, who would care about that? But we need to slow it down. And I couldn't agree with that more. And slowing it down to learn from what's in front of us at that moment, whatever it is. Does that tie into what you were hoping? Yeah, I absolutely love it. And I love <laughs> bebopping around as well. I think I might steal that one from you. Yeah, we're bebopping. <laughs> Stop bebopping. Yeah. Power <laughs> down the cell phone and no bebopping. <laughs> Just be present. And you know who else really talks about that? Um, it was actually, I think, two or three years ago, uh, Kathy Sadeo and I had a great conversation about that um, off to the side at a conference. And, and Kathy is very much about, you know, when she looks for her, sh for her, um, for her uh, shards on the beach, you know, Kathy's, she's there with Smudge, her dog, and she's walking the beach looking for shards. And she's in the moment, she's slowing it down, she's present with where she's at. Because if we keep, you know, if, if we keep going all paws blazing, and we don't recharge our batteries, we're going to miss a lot. We're missing a lot. We're not going to miss. It's, it's happening. This, this, this resonates with me in my life. And I know it's something that I need to learn how to do better. So I'm glad that we had this conversation today. Me too. I had a great time. And thank you for offering me chicken visually. You can't get away from uh, us yet. We still have one more question for you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please take us into the future, Laura, now? And just before we finish, share with us what you would really like to see happen over the next five to 10 years in the animal training world. Mm. Gosh, one thing. We can do more than one thing. I think my, my first thought is, uh, and I think this kind of bridges back to, you know, memorable mentors, the ones we've had or the ones that we hope to be, is I hope that our culture continues to tip our hat to citing the work of other people that we learn from. Um, there's no quick fame here. There's nothing about, you know, being the best at anything. Each of us are where we're at in our careers because we learned something from someone else. And then we may have put our own experiences and perspectives and applications into it. But I look at what my colleagues are doing that are, you know, um, in graduate school or working towards a PhD, have a PhD or are, are doing a postdoc. And when you look at their work, they're citing other people. They tip their hat to other people. Um, I will tell you that 
uh, I'm always grateful if someone tags me on social media and says, you know, hey, Laura, thanks for this video. Or I see them tag another colleague that's doing great work. Because everything that we're teaching and sharing, it's it's a collaboration. And we need to cite the book that we read it from or the article that we read it from. And I'm hoping that in this quick fix society of technology and everything being at our fingertips, that we don't forget the importance of giving due diligence to those that we learn from as well. And so um, I hope to see that continue with with generations of, of new trainers, um, you know, whether they read something by so-and-so or so-and-so, or they listened to your podcast and they started to apply it within their learning because we're all here together. You know, we're all here collaborating. That's where I hope to see things keep moving. And I think just swinging back to our, our, our earlier topic of, of um, knowing that learning and progress is a process, advocating for slowing things down and watching the leaps and bounds that people are going to make as they, you know, I know empower is a big word right now, but as we're empowering dog owners, pet owners, equine, avian, canine, feline, you know, or exotic animals, that uh, there's so much to be learned in the power of observation, so much that we can learn by watching what the animals naturally do. And that's, that's where you and I come from, from exotic animal backgrounds is, you know, we, we can't grab an animal if we're observing them even in the wild or with, uh, you know, observing wild dolphins. They're in their habitat. This is their natural habitat. You, you can't grab them and, and make them come back. You're observing how they navigate high boat traffic. You're observing how they navigate fishermen in their environment. You're observing how they navigate um, people on jet skis, you know. So no matter the species, if you're out bird watching in your local park, if you're rural or urban, how are the birds behaving? being changed because of human uh, impact. So I hope there's more awareness of conservation down the road and the potential detrimental effect that we're having as a human species, but then the wonderful beneficial impact that we can have to help species in the wild as well. That's all right. I got. It's more than enough, Laura. That's a great <laughs> way to, to wrap the podcast up. Hey, thank you so much for everything. Before we do say our goodbyes, just let people know one more time where they can go to find out more about you and, and what you're up to. Sure. Um, you guys, you know, I, I, I'm from Chicago, so I'm going to say you guys. Uh, you can you guys. visit Laura Monaco, you guys, uh, Laura Monaco Torelli.com or Animal Behavior Training Concepts.com or explore the joy of learning together.com it's all the same website and we'll link to that in the podcast write-up as well on, my, on behalf of myself laura and from everyone listening today we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show it's really appreciated thank you oh thank you for having me you're an amazing host you're so easy to banter back and forth with and i can't believe um two hours i know the front end wasn't recorded but two hours and 15 minutes flew by which means i had a blast too well that's thank very, you for everything you do that's very reinforcing and, and a huge compliment so uh, that's me that means a lot to me and uh we'll put a big smile on my face for the rest of the day thank you wonderful well waving from chicago to you <laughs> and to and everyone you. out there around the planet we really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive the most fun choice rich ways then as mentioned at the start of this episode the animal training academy community is waiting for you head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode though. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening and you will hear from us again soon.